Okay. Right. Uh, so we're going to start the, the session. And uh, first of all, I should thank uh, Sri Academy uh, to inviting me to deliver this uh, presentation. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, some practice changing cases, uh, which I personally involved in the management in emergency department. Um, so most of you have, uh, I think, heard of emergency department. It's not like typical uh, emergency treatment unit or um, a preliminary care unit, which we were uh, managing patients a few years back. Now we have well-developed a &E, uh, units. Uh, so what's uh, different uh, compared to the other units in the emergency department? So it means that uh, we don't know what exactly coming to our emergency settings, uh, the patients or what will happen to the uh, in next few seconds, what will happen to the patient. So it's kind of um, uh, unpredictable things and unpredictable patients are coming and but we have to manage then and there and uh, stabilize the patient. So that's why emergency department is uh, different because we have to sort out the patient and uh, uh, we have to uh, come to some sort of a diagnosis during our management. So how many, uh, what kind of patients as we are getting? That's the other uh, question. It could be a, a patient with chest trauma uh, required uh, IC tube insertion or maybe intubation with the significant facial trauma, or sometimes a child with unknown poisoning or a very sick child or a continuous seizure which required intubation. And even a lady coming with abdominal pain, it may be a delivery, which we ever never expect and disasters, which is not a very um, rare thing to happen in emergency settings. Right, so if you can, you can see that we encountering a lot of unpredictable uh, uh, presentations. So then we should have some sort of uh, approach or specific approach to each and every patient. That's why in emergency units, we have a very structured, an organized uh, team approach. And how we can approach to a critically ill patient, it depends on how you practice. So that's why we have to have regular teaching and training. This is how we uh, trained ourselves during the COVID pandemic. And uh, so our teaching won't stop with uh, anything. So we have to continue teaching and we have to continue learning. And every uh, member of the emergency unit uh, should have some sort of equal knowledge about the uh, patient's management and uh, patient's presentation. So uh, I'm going to start, uh, uh, talk about five important cases with all patients are real patients, so those are not fictional cases. And uh, so we'll move to the case one. So case one, syncopal episode. So syncope is something very common to present in emergency unit. And it's not only in the emergency, uh, even in the medical wards, in the surgical wards, you can encounter patients with syncope. So this is, this was happened actually at 9.30 p.m. Um, patient was a 35 year old female and uh, she was uh, she actually came uh, with a history of fall but uh, then the, she mentioned that she had a syncope and hit the head on the floor uh, she mentioned that she had a, a similar kind of uh, disease spell one week back and uh, at that time she was investigated and found to be having a type 2 diabetes uh, now she complains of uh, very lethargic uh, sense so so then our assessment in the emergency unit. If someone wonder about what is this A, B, C, D, E, this is the approach uh, we are doing in emergency department, especially in critically ill patients. You know, we have a triad system in emergency department and uh, we sort in out patient according to severity of the illness. And then uh, especially patients with CAT1 and CAT2, those are the critically ill patients coming to the resuscitation area. We uh, assess and uh, exclude life-threatening injuries and then um, do the management at the same time. So that's what we call primary survey. So uh, this lady's um, 
yeah, we was patent and it was a head trauma. So uh, we should have uh, rule out the cervical spinal injuries, and uh, but all were cleared. And uh, other than the tachypnea, her lungs were fine. And uh, we found that uh, she was having a significant tachycardia with hypotension. So blood pressure was 75 by 45. So the key uh, thing in this uh, case was C, that is cardiovascular state was compromised. But uh, she was conscious, uh, her sugar was uh, slightly elevated, 320, and uh, we couldn't find any other injuries and her temperature was normal. So we move to the next step, that is assessment uh, and management. If you are in the emergency unit, you will realize that we have very limited time to assess and come to a diagnosis, as well as we have very limited resources. Especially we are using clinical skills and the knowledge, most of the cases, uh, and it may be about seven to eight percent and come to a diagnosis. And sometimes we're using some supportive investigations like uh, venous blood glass, uh, capillary blood sugar, bedside ECG, and point of care ultrasound which is a new involvement in emergency units. And perhaps you have uh, seen that uh, lots of uh, critical care settings now we are using point of care ultrasound to come to a diagnosis. So uh, in this patient, the clinical assessment, clearly it was a shock. So now, now the uh, next question is, uh, what kind of shock? Or what could be the cause for this shock? Um, well, we have supportive uh, investigations. So VBD shows significant metabolic acidosis with a lactate of uh, eight. And uh, we did a bedside ultrasound scan. Uh, so you know that's their way of approaching to a shock patient. And uh, as example, RUSH protocol, we're using in the POC a point of care ultrasound to assess a patient with hypotension. So we did a scan and we found that uh, nothing significant in a routine scan, like uh, no free fluid, um, lungs were clear and dry lungs, but IVC was full, but patient was having shock. So it's something unusual thing. Then we plan to do a proper echo, uh, bedside echo. So I mentioned that primary survey always assessment at the same time, the management. So we applied patients on oxygen and start, uh, inserted two large uh, IV can, two large bulk cannula and give, uh, gave uh, two liters of fluid. So unfortunately, patient went to a peri-arrest, near peri-arrest condition twice. So we had to give ad, uh, adrenal stress doses and uh, was started on noradrenal infusion. And uh, although patient was not having significant uh, uh, history of uh, infection, empirically we started IV antibiotics. And, but unfortunately there was a very minimal response uh, to this management. I mentioned that bedside echo. Well, uh, if you are familiar with uh, bedside scan, I know that most of you have familiar with the eFAST, but it's better if you can be familiar with what sort of views we can get through the heart uh, echocardiography. Uh, there are uh, well uh, standard uh, views we have to get in echocardiography, but uh, uh, even with the subcostal view, which is included in the eFAST, you can assess the heart and you can come to a, uh, a very important decisions uh, regarding the cardiac conditions. So the basic anatomy that you know, uh, the left side of the heart is usually larger than the right side of the heart. And if you can see this, you can clearly see that the right side of the heart is somewhat larger than the left side of the heart. Well, if the right side of the heart is larger than left side of the heart, there should be definitely some sort of a pathology. So it could be, uh, most of the uh, time, it could be uh, increased pulmonary blood pressure or the pulmonary hypertension. So it could be acute or chronic. If this is a patient with uh, otherwise healthy and coming with the scene copy with a sud and found to be having shock. So this could be some acute problem. So what do you think of sudden increase of pulmonary pressure? So could it be pulmonary embolism? Well, yes. We 
actually that uh, this patient was referred to the specialist team and uh, they thought that could be decay sometimes uh, with high blood sugar and coming with shock could it be decay but uh, with experience, we know that it is very rare to have patients with DK to come with a shock. And it's a young lady and coming with uh, uh, syncope and was found to be having enlarged right side of the heart. So the emergency physicians came to diagnose most of the time it could be PE. So CDP confirmed pulmonary embolism and the patient was treated with enoxaparin and was discharged on day three. Right, so clinical pulse. You should not miss pulmonary embolism. Is it rare? No, of course not. It is not such a rare condition to be happened. Only thing is that sometimes it went unnoticed uh, and uh, so it may be delayed in diagnosis. So the important thing uh, in this case is that you have to take a good history. If a patient come in with syncope, always ask whether it is a primary or a secondary, whether it, it was due to uh, some cause or it was just a mechanical fall. So always it's important secondary syncope to be investigated. And if a patient's having syncope plus unstable vitals, always look for pulmonary embolism. This is something like a mantra. And uh, we know that uh, tachycardia is kind of a um, common thing in pulmonary embolism. That's what we learned. But uh, remember, tachypnea could be commoner than tachycardia. So if patients come in with respiratory distress, especially acute respiratory distress, this is something you should come. Uh, one thing should include at your differential diagnosis. And um, Emergency unit is a place where we use lots of uh, uh, risk stratification tools. Uh, it means that uh, in patients come into the emergency unit, we should have to find out whether this patient uh, should be discharged or whether this patient should be admitted. Uh, if, we, if we are going to admit this patient, whether it is uh, ICU or the ward. So that's why we use lots of risk stratification tools to uh, come to a, a decision regarding the disposition of the patient. Uh, the clinical probability of having a pulmonary embolism uh, can be assessed uh, through uh, one of the, the such two, uh, tool and uh, which we commonly call a uh, well score, but it's not only a score that we can uh, use for clinical uh, probability assessment in pulmonary embolism, but modified well score is very commonly used and uh, if you can, you can use it, uh, uh, you don't want to remember, but uh, you can go to the internet and log into the MedCal and you can find that uh, there's automatically, you can do the calculations. So if the uh, calculation comes as less than four, then the patient's having a very low risk for pulmonary embolism or pulmonary embolism is unlikely. So these patients, we can, uh, we can put another rule called PERC rule. So that's also come in the medical. And uh, if you apply the PERC rule to the patients with low risk category, and it came as negative, you can discharge safely this patient without doing any further investigations. Remember, without doing further investigations. But if the PERC rule is positive, then yes, you have to do D-dimer test. But if patients have a high risk or the score is more than four, the pulmonary embolism is high likely. And then definitely you have to go for a CT scan or CTPA, but not the D-dimer. D-dimer is not an uh, investigation to rule in uh, pulmonary embolism, but to rule out uh, pulmonary embolism because it's a negative D-dimer is the most important thing. It's not the positive D-dimer. And uh, there are uh, PESI, another restratification tool, uh, which is called pulmonary embolism severity index, which actually determine the mortality uh, in pulmonary embolism and then uh, can come to uh, what sort of treatment modality we should have to give. In pregnancy, uh, there's a pregnancy adapted years algorithm, uh, which is more specific compared to the well score. So, what do you think of uh, this, all these scores? always trust your clinical judgment. The scores are tools, but not rules. So you don't want to um, 
strict stick to the uh, this course, but you can have a, some sort of a guidance for your management. Well, I mentioned that point of ultrasound, which is one of an invaluable uh, tool and assessment in shock patient. If you have time, be uh, if you have uh, uh, access to a ultrasound scan in your department in your unit, please. Uh, be familiar with that. And there are lots of resources you can use to be a uh, good uh, sonographer. So at least emergency sonography is very important. Right, we'll move to the next case. So chest pain, which is kind of a very common thing in critical care settings, not only the emergency units, uh, everywhere you can find that uh, with different causes can come with chest pain. So this is a gentleman who came around 2.30 p.m., a uh, 45-year-old male. Uh, he was uh, healthy, but he was a smoker, and uh, he complained of acute chest pain uh, around uh, 11, 11 a.m., and it was unbearable, and uh, he vomited twice, sweaty. So looking at the patient, what's your first diagnosis? Could it be STEMI? That's the first thing that's come to their mind. Well, we did assessment and uh, we found that uh, patient was airways patent and uh, there was uh, mild tachypnea and uh, tachycardia, but otherwise hemodynamic stable. And uh, the, the most important uh, component in primary survey of this patient was the E. We are uh, expose the patient because complaint of chest pain you mean do you have to expose the chest and see what's exactly happening it's not only the symptom it could be some signs that you can elicit so we found that patient's abdomen is slightly distended but when we examine it, it was mildly tender generalized tenderness but it was very mild and uh, it was inappropriate to the pain that patient complained of and, uh, and there was no rigidity or garden so then we asked the patient exactly tell where you have the pain. So he pointed out to the epigastric region. Then, you know, the epigastric means it is a demarcation between chest and abdomen. So you have to rule out everything, uh, every pathology in the chest and abdomen a patient who come in with epigastric pain. Well, so the clinical diagnosis, so most probable cause, could it be acute coronary syndrome? And there are some other abdominal pathologies like perforated viscous and uh, acute intestinal obstruction, mesenteric ischemia. So there are, those are some acute abdominal pathology in a middle-aged male who come in with acute abdomen. The VBG, which shows significant lactic acidosis. This is something sinister. So acute pain, with the lactate of 15 and something that there should be underlying serious pathology. And uh, unfortunately, this patient CCG was, uh, there's sinus rhythm, there's no ischemia. So we came to a, a very doubtful condition. That's what could it be? We did a point of care ultrasound and we found uh, there was a significant dilated power loops, but the cardiographic or cardiography was normal. So no wall motion defect in the heart or pericardial effusion. So then we came to diagnosis. Could it be purely abdominal pathology? So our first diagnosis, could it be mesenteric ischemia? We did a formal ultrasound scan. Remember, scan is not a, a pathognomonic uh, or the uh, standard uh, test of uh, gold standard in uh, bubble pathologies, but uh, this is this was happening in a peripheral unit, so we didn't have pro, uh, access to the CT scan, so we did uh, formal ultrasound. It also showed there's possibility of mesenteric ischemia, and uh, within 15 minutes of presentation uh, to the emergency unit, this patient was uh, diagnosed to have some sort of uh, um, diagnosis uh, like possible mesenteric ischemia and uh, did a surgical referral and uh, referred for an emergency laparotomy. Right, so the main clinical pearl, you have to think, the pain is always misleading. 
sometimes you may have to give a uh, huge gravity for the pain. Sometimes you may neglect in the pain, especially in young patients coming with significant pain. But remember, pain is always misleading. You have to come to a proper diagnosis where exactly this patient's pain. So expose, expose the patient as much as possible to come to a proper diagnosis. Sometimes uh, patients may tell him that, uh, pain in somewhere, but actually the patient is having pain in somewhere, so elsewhere. So that's why you have to ask the patient to just exactly tell where exactly that patient's uh, pain is uh, occurring. And then uh, talking about this mesenteric ischemia, Remember, there's no hard and fast rule to diagnose mesenteric ischemia. There's no pathognomonic signs we can uh, find out. But the common classic exam finding is that pain out of proportion. It means patients complain of severe pain, but when you come to the abdominal examination, it's uh, fairly little signs you can elicit. And uh, it depends on the, what could uh, the reason for the uh, mesenteric ischemia. Uh, perhaps you have heard of acute arterial embolus, which is the commonest one uh, for causing uh, mesenteric ischemia. And they are the patients who come in with intense acute pain. And the arterial thrombosis, uh, this could be uh, like a chronic pathology. So they usually comes with intestinal angina. It means that they are having abdominal pain just after having a meal. So there's a food phobia. And venous thrombosis, uh, they have very non-specific symptoms like longer history of pain, sometimes present with diarrhea. So it's something very unusual presentation, but remember if a patient's coming with pain out of proportion, always abdominal pain out of proportion, always examine abdomen and uh, to rule out mesenteric ischemia. Well, we know that almost most of you are uh, they are fairly rely on the uh, lactate level in mesenteric ischemia. So if you believe that lactate is uh, positive, then yes, it is mesenteric ischemia, but remember it's not so. Lactate is not a sensitive uh, test, uh, especially to rule out the disease. So even if it is negative, we can't tell that this patient was not having, it's not having a mesenteric ischemia. So remember lactate is just a supportive uh, evidence. Test of choice is CT angiography, and uh, perhaps uh, we may not have the uh, uh, resources uh, to do this, come to this diagnosis, like in our case. So definitely then it is a clinical diagnosis and you have to go for the uh, uh, definitive treatment that is maybe uh, in the surgery. So that's why how to do early diagnosis and surgical, early surgical involvement is critical, especially within uh, six hours of uh, presentation, the patient should go into a surgical um, involvement. Otherwise, uh, the survival rate is uh, significantly uh, reducing, like uh, mortality rate is may, maybe more than 60 to 80%. All right, so this is one of, I think the most interest case among these all five cases, uh, a patient who had a collapse. This, is, this was actually not a patient originally. Uh, he was a bystander of an inward patient emergency unit. Fortunately, this 55-year-old male collapsed in front of the emergency unit. So patient was rushed to the emergency department. The only history we took was only a bystander. We don't know anything about this patient. So uh, patient was not responding, no breathing and no central pulse. So definitely then it is a ca cardiac arrest. So we started CPR and uh, we attached the monitor and uh, we found having this chaotic appearing rhythm. So Perhaps you may be familiar with this. And I think you always, all, almost all of you should be familiar with the uh, life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. This is one thing called ventricular fibrillation. So the treatment for the VF is given immediate shock. And uh, so we gave immediate shock and uh, inserted a LMA. Uh, and uh, fortunately, this patient uh, came to a sinus rhythm in five minutes. So point of care ultrasound, we did a bedside scan 
and found to have in uh, anteroceptal wall hypokinesia. That means some of the part of the cardiac wall is not functioning as usual, as normal. Uh, but there was no any pericardial effusion or any other wall rupture we couldn't find. And uh, we did the bedside echo, it showed anterior stemi. So that is a reversible cause for the uh, this cardiac arrest. So, so we treated immediately with tenecteplase. 20 minutes after the thrombolysis, patient was moving limbs and uh, we noticed some spontaneous breathing attempts, but it was a bit of irregular. So we decided to intubate. There we had a nightmare. So intubation attempts. This was actually a, a patient who came with the crisis and uh, we don't have any uh, uh, sort of a, uh, pre-prepared plan or pre-prepared assessment of ARV whether this patient may require difficult intubation. So it was initially attempted by medical officer because uh, by that appearance, this is just average be a gentleman and uh, couldn't find any obvious uh, difficult ARV um, problems. Uh, and so managed, uh, attempted by MO twice and uh, three times by the emergency physician. So then, was failed. We escalated to anesthetic team, and while they are trying to intubate, we declared this is failed intubation because none of us couldn't see the larynx. So what could be the next? So there should be a life-saving procedure. Yes. So we had to do the emergency cricothyrotomy. So this was totally unaccepted thing, unexpected thing. And uh, we didn't thought that this, you can see that the, the appearance, this was not a hugely obese patient, but unfortunately we had to do this procedure. And you know the risk of this doing procedure who are just thrombolized. So the bleeding risk is very high, but somehow we were able to save this patient. Patient was sent to the ICU, was underwent, uh, underwent a tracheostomy on day two and was discharged on uh, day eight. So if you're dealing with airway, anticipate everything. So don't think that, or don't be overconfident when managing airways. Sometimes we believe that I have done so many intubations, so I'm very comfortable in doing intubate. But remember, patients are varied, so we can't expect uh, that's everything going in a smooth way. So that's why there are lots of algorithms have come uh, regarding this intubation. If you are dealing with the unconscious, unreactive or near death patients, then you are dealing with the crash airways. So you have to follow the crash airway algorithm. And if you found that patient is conscious and otherwise find that you can have some time, you have some time to assess the patient's airway. And if we found that the patient is having difficulty, this is a very common thing, especially your pre-medication in the theater, and sometimes even in emergency department where if you are doing the procedure sedation, you have some time to assess the patient's airway. Then you have time to prepare. And uh, then it is called difficult airway. Difficult airway algo should be followed. If you don't find that patients have a difficult DRV, then straight away you can go for the rapid sequence induction. But remember, there's another, what we call DSI or delayed sequence induction, which is one of the commonest in practice in the emergency care settings, which I will explain later. If you found that patients have a crash or a difficult DRV is failed, and there are some definition how you can define this failed or how you can declare this failed airway. So then uh, you have to uh, follow the failed airway algorithm. Right, so I'm just briefly tell about this failed airway. There are one of three things should uh, uh, complete for the uh, to declare the failed airway. It could be a uh, failure to intubate in a patient whom oxygenation cannot be maintained with back valve mask. Or sometimes it is, could be a three unsuccessful intubation by attempts by expert while maintaining the oxygenation. Or it could be a failed single intubation attempt or what we call one best attempt in the forced to act condition, which is similar to the Kant intubation 
plant oxygenation, oxygenation scenarios. So what you have to do in, um, if you're going to intubate a patient, whether it's a crisis or a difficult job, always remember you should have a backup plan and airway plan. There's a checklist. You can uh, go to the internet and you can uh, search on for airway checklist. Plan. So let's always be prepared for everything. Since we had a, a, some sort of airway planned, uh, because always in emergency care settings, we, or if you're going to intubate, uh, we always have a uh, airway planned and we always stick to, uh, stick to that uh, plan. So that's why we had uh, all the resources uh, to do this emergency cricothyrotomy. And uh, so remember, always go with the airway plan. And pre-oxygenation. We know that you can put a, continue your face mask oxygen, or you can, uh, if the patient's on a CPAP, you can continue CPAP as a pre-oxygenation method. And you can do vent manual ventilation if the saturation is less than 91. The most important thing is optimize the patient before intubation. Usually, if the patient is in a uh, critical conditions, so optimize the patient's vital, optimize the fluid states. Uh, you can give fluid, you can give boluses of pressor doses, and you can start some vasopressors. So whatever you have to start before the intubation, because intubation per se is something uh, which is going to be a huge stress to the patient's physiology, and that will further compromise uh, his or her usual condition. What about the doses of the drugs that we use? Well, induction, that's induction drugs. Commonly, we are using uh, propofol, ketamine, midazolam. So those induction agents, uh, the dose should be reduced, but you can increase the paralytic uh, doses, the paralytic drugs, succimethonium, rocuronium, vecuronium. So you can increase the dose of the paralytic in hypotension or compromised cardiovascular state. And uh, I think this is fairly common. I mentioned about DSI or delayed sequence induction, which is uh, a procedure we are following uh, in intubating an agitated patient. So most of the time in emergency care settings, we encounter lots of agitated or delirious patients. It's really difficult to do uh, follow the proper procedure. Sometimes they're not keeping the oxygen mask and struggling. We can't keep the cannula. So what we have to do is give a small dose of sedation prior to the intubation to settle and calm down the patient. After calm down, that you can apply oxygen mask and follow the next few steps of the airway plan. So what you can use for the sedation, whatever the drug set, but it should be very small amount and titrated uh, according to the patient's clinical appearance. So you can use ketamine, one to two milligram per kg, but remember none of the drugs are 100% uh, uh, expert in uh, managing uh, conditions, especially remember that ketamine, we know it is a very cardio, um, uh, um, very helpful for the cardiac uh, uh, compromised heart because it, it won't cause uh, uh, reduced blood pressure or uh, compromise the uh, airway as much. But uh, remember, in a compromised heart, not any drug can cause problems. Even the ketamine can uh, reduce the blood pressure. So that's why you always titrate the dose. And there's a lot, all myth regarding uh, the intubation of traumatic brain injury, uh, whether the ketamine, uh, because we believe that ketamine is contraindicated in traumatic brain injury because we believe that can cause increased intracranial pressure. Well, lots of research has found it is the best drug that you can use in trauma settings, especially if the patient's having hypotension or normal tension. Uh, ketamine can increase the blood pressure. That's why we are not using uh, uh, conditions where high blood pressure, but if the patient's having hypotension or normal tension, you can use ketamine. And yeah, most of the time we are using ketamine in trauma settings. And what about the apneic oxygenation? If anyone heard of this, uh, have heard of this apneic oxygenation, uh, or anyone who haven't heard, it is the best practice that you should have to follow. You know that we should, we are giving a pre-oxygenation, so, and 
once patient is paralyzed, then what we call, we remove the oxygen source and then go for the intubation. But during that time, uh, the patient is not on any oxygen resource. So ideally, you should have two resources of oxygen, one for the pre-oxygenation and other one uh, through a nasal prong. So you can give 50 liters per minute. It should be applied before the intubation and continue until you, uh, until you complete the intubation, secure the airway. So this will uh, prevent desaturation during intubation by increasing the apneic time uh, so that you can get more time uh, or you can do it very leisurely, the intubation you can be done very leisurely without any problems. And at least you should have some sort of uh, experience or uh, knowledge about rescue procedures like emergency cricothyrotomy, scalpel or needles, cricothyrotomy, cricothyroid puncture, or emergency tracheostomy. So these are something that uh, you should be familiar, at least you have to watch videos and have some sort of idea. I'll just briefly uh, tell about uh, this, uh, what we did. So it was just, uh, if you're a right-handed person, you can come to the right side of the uh, uh, patient and uh, palpate the thyroid cartilage from the non-dominant hand. And then the, it should be um, fixed and then put a uh, longitudinal incision through the scalpel just uh, uh, below the uh, uh, thyroid cartilage because in emergency settings, it may not be possible to palpate the cricothyroid membrane. So go with blindly. Uh, and then uh, if you have just on the scalpel, just put a vertical incision. And then once you pierce into the uh, airway, you can turn it into horizontal, and then you can insert the bougie and rail over the ET tube through the bougie. But if you have fancy instruments like uh, tracheal dilator, or uh, even artery forceps, you can use for this scenario. Bleeding, don't be afraid of bleeding. It can settle uh, with the pressure and uh, with time. And what sort of tube you have to insert? It is uh, six or 6.5. Uh, best is the cuff tube, but if you don't have cuff tube, or you can go with the non-cuff. But remember, since because of the bleeding, better to go with the cuff tube. Right, so. We're moving to the next case. So we have managed lots of adult patients. Now we are moving to a, a child who come in with uh, came with altered behavior. So this was happened midday, and a two year old boy. Uh, parents uh, mentioned that uh, they noticed that uh, this boy was having some funny movements uh, for half an hour duration. He was completely fine, a very active, well child, and was playing with his sister, uh, but uh, parents were not in the near vicinity, but they denied impossible trauma. So immunization development, we didn't have any concerns. So the assessment, uh, the most important thing is here is the D. Well, there was a tachycardia anyhow, but uh, otherwise the vitals are stable. But we noticed that patient was uh, alert, but there's intermittent uh, abnormal bizarre movements. There was sometimes moving all four limbs, uh, but intermittent paddling movements of the lower limb. And we noticed sometimes intermittent staring gaze, sometimes grimacing face and uh, protruding tongue and uh, intermittent arcing posture, not like uh, typical obstetronous posture, uh, but otherwise uh, couldn't find any obvious uh, neurological uh, pathology and uh, sugar was normal, temperature was normal, and uh, we want to rule out any possible trauma or head injury. So they couldn't find any other injuries or any skin rashes. So what do you think? So it's kind of a bizarre appearance and it was acutely started. Well, we thought, could it be a seizure? Because sometimes seizure not comes with the typical uh, features. So then if it is a seizure, what could be the cause? Because this child was completely fine. And uh, we did a VBG, it shows a mild metabolic acidosis, which is quite acceptable if it is a seizure and sugar was normal, uh, did anyway bedside scan, 
and we couldn't find any free fluid uh, uh, to show that's where the possibility of trauma because we don't know what exactly happened and the parents were unaware of until we managed the patient. So we did uh, start on oxygen and uh, send blood, especially for electrolyte. And we anyhow started high midazolam. And fortunately, the child was settled with the midazolam. So we thought, could it, this could be seizure, but it could be something else. Even midazolam is a, a universal drug we can use for anything. And uh, since the child was having my tachycardia and a uh, bit of a high lactate, so we started a, a normal saline bolus uh, followed by maintenance. Well, about one hour later, parents were told someone in the house that uh, probably sister, we don't know, that uh, the child had swallowed two mothballs. So you know it is contained camphor. So camphor poisoning, significant camphor poisoning can cause convulsions. So sometimes the convulsions may not come with typical features. So uh, the child was discharged on the next day after observation and IV fluid and uh, couldn't find any uh, consequence of uh, this, but we don't know whether it's uh, two more balls per se, but could be more than that. But anyway, it was a camp of poison. Well, what do you think about the children's, the pediatric emergencies? Remember, children are always suspicious. Silence is golden, but unless you have kids. So that's something you should have to think. Careful history is the most important thing in pediatric emergencies. So ask, uh, always believe about the, what the parents are telling. And, but you know, the exception is uh, NAI, non accidental injuries, but most of the time, uh, uh, ask what the patient was having. Just go in deep into the history uh, of the current presentation and then ask about uh, the patient's intake and output for the last 24 hours and uh, any change in the appearance or the activity. These are the main three factors you have to ask in pediatric history. I'm, uh, I'm telling these things because whatever the condition, whatever the disease, the patient may have high risk of getting the, um, dehydration. So that's why we had to assess the dehydration. This is kind of something killer in pediatric population. And if you have found acute onset unexplained behavior or seizure, always rule out toxic ingestion. So because sometimes uh, these unsupervised uh, children can come with some bizarre uh, behaviors or seizures. So always we don't know what exactly happened. So that should be number one in your list and how you can decontaminate in pediatric overdose. You can use activated charcoal that the dose is one gram per kg. And if the patient is maintaining airway and you know the time, exact time of ingestion. But for all the children, if they are conscious, rational, if they are willing to take, then yes, you can go ahead with activated charcoal. What about the gastric lava arch induced vomiting? No. We are not using anymore and it should be out of practice. So don't use gastric lavage and you, you can't get anything uh, significant benefit doing that. If you are suspicious about the, this overdose and uh, always you can contact the poison center, tell about the patient's clinical appearance and the vital scent, what could be the possible cause and get, the, get their help. And remember, one pill can kill medications. There are some medications that uh, even a one tablet can be life-threatening. And uh, so, in, or even a small amount can be life-threatening. So you should have a knowledge about these medications like calcium channel blocker, sulfonylurea, uh, aspirin, TCA. So which usually uh, that uh, parents or the, any other adult taking it Form. Uh, this can be a common uh, resource for the overdose in pediatric. So you have to have some sort of a knowledge about these medications and how you should manage. Right, we'll move to the final case. This was an accident. So it was a busy uh, uh, time in the emergency unit. We had four critically ill patients, uh, three were um, having uh, bad accidents and one was intubated 
So this lady came to the resus, was taken by 1990 ambulance service. Uh, she was a 46 year old scooter driver. She uh, had a, a RTA. It was always asked about the mechanism of injury. And she mentioned, she, she actually didn't mention it was taken from the uh, ambulance. So she had a front end collision on a parked lorry. So she was wearing a helmet. Um, as for the eyewitnesses, uh, it was not like a higher, uh, very high speed collision and uh, denied any history of loss of consciousness. So uh, 1990 ambulance paramedics, they have uh, put a collar, cervical collar, and uh, the EMTs have put a plaster under the chin because there was a laceration. So before we examine this patient, uh, there was a surgical SHO who was near another patient. So he saw this patient and just uh, went to close by uh, to see the patient and uh, look at uh, so roughly that uh, what the patient's having and mentioned that uh, no obvious concern, but go ahead with the fast scan and let them know about any uh, concerns. So after that, we had a person our review, we found uh, uh, this, uh, this sticker or the plaster, we removed the plaster and we found this, this significant deep three centimeter laceration under the chin and couldn't find any active bleeding. But when we asked the patient to talk or protrude the tongue, she couldn't do, she can, she can obey the commands, but she couldn't do that process, she couldn't talk. And we noticed a mild oral bleeding. And when we remove the color and uh, then found that larynx is not palpable and there was a subcutaneous emphysema and uh, but there's no any expanded hematoma and significant there was significant posterior upper cervical spinal tendons so there's a mild tachypnea but otherwise uh, no chest wall deformities or trauma and mild tachycardia hemodynamics were stable GCS was actually, she was conscious, but only problem is a verbal component. She couldn't express the feeling. And we couldn't find any other injuries. So we found that this could be an isolated neck trauma. Well, it could be ARV and cervical spine injury. And uh, we did a, a bedside scan. The EFAST was negative, but neck, we can do the neck uh, even for the musculoskeletal scan and assess for a trauma. So we had a doubt whether it's possible laryngeal trauma. And always, if there's a neck trauma, you had to rule out uh, by blunt carotid intersection, so blunt trauma. So we couldn't find any evidence, but this was a bedside scan. So we put the patient on face mask oxygen and remove the cervical collar because there's obviously neck injury, but maintain the manual inline stabilization. So this is the patients who couldn't maintain the ARV. And we convinced the ENT team that this patient should go for awake intubation. It's a bit of a tricky to do the intubation with a laryngeal injury without uh, the blind intubation. So um, they accepted and uh, we did awake intubation, just exactly you can see in the picture. And uh, so it was, but even with the foil, the uh, five optic laryngoscopy, they uh, didn't see any obvious laryngeal injury. Uh, and patient was connected to the ventilator spontaneous mode and then sent for the CT scan. So CT showed comminuted laryngeal fracture and C3, C5 subluxation, but no evidence of vascular injuries. So this patient was sent to the tertiary center for neurosurgical and ENT management. Right, so in trauma, always trust your first love. So complete physical exam is most important than the, the CT scan. So you should have to get a proper exposure, uh, proper exams before come to a decision. So don't trust the investigation itself will do everything. Talking a little bit about the neck trauma, which is something we are neglecting in trauma assessment. We always look for the chest, abdomen, pelvis, and the limbs and the head, but always forget about the connection between the head and the torso, the neck. This, this is why uh, lost, uh, most of the time, this will be a delayed presentation. And uh, CT angiography is a test of choice to assess the vasculature of the 
neck trauma because uh, remember that there are important structures uh, in the, within the neck, airway and uh, carotid vessels, uh, jugular veins and uh, lower uh, cranial nerves uh, and thoracic duct. So those are important structures. And if you're found that uh, uh, neck trauma, clear the cervical collar or uh, clear the cervical collar clinically. So you don't, usually we are not applying cervical collar uh, in uh, tra neck trauma situations. Uh, it is purely uh, because it can be contraindicated to have a tight collar around the neck, but you have to maintain the cervical spine. You can go ahead with clearance, the clinical uh, scores and clinical rules. And remember, you have to, uh, even though you couldn't find any obvious uh, um, trauma or injuries, you should have to watch these patients closely because sometimes some of the manifestation can be laid. So for the um, explanation purposes and to have some sort of a diagnosis, we are uh, categorizing the neck trauma into three categories, category one, two, three, or so on, one, two, three. So the zone two, that's the middle part, uh, is the most exposed zone, and it is the most uh, uh, common, commonly injured in uh, trauma. So what you have to look, if you found there are hard signs, soft signs, so read about that. If you found these hard signs, this patient should, if the patient's having hard signs like expanded hematoma, it's not a good patient for the further workup, should go to the theater immediately. And if there's severe acute bleeding and shock nets were not responding to the fluid or absent or reduced radial pulse, and uh, sometimes can hear the vascular brui or cerebral features of cerebral ischemia or ARV obstruction. So definitely patient need uh, immediate surgical intervention. So what about the intubation in neck trauma? If you have a doubt, always go for the intubation. It could be um, early or prophylactically, especially if the patient's having features suggestive of airway threatening, like stridor, respiratory distress, shock, and rapidly expanded hematoma, go ahead with intubation. As remember, if there's a laryngeal injury, the blind intubation is very tricky, and then you have to go with the awake intubation if you have uh, the resources. But if there's any active bleeding, you should have to use the direct pressure, not the uh, clamping. No, we are not advising clamping anymore. So use direct pressure with the gauze and uh, pressure bandage, gauze and uh, not the pressure bandage um, and control the bleeding. Uh, if you found that uh, this patient is having, uh, may have an internal jugular vein injury, then place the patient in a Trendelenburg position to prevent AI embolism. So the most important thing is early and uh, early surgical consultation. All right. So, what do you think of emergency care settings, the management, and uh, how you uh, see the patients? So, what's the secret of managing emergencies efficiently? Start thin slicing, and when busy use your blink response. You know that emergency physicians often know uh, in 30 to 60 seconds what their patients will need. So it is a practice. Go to back, go back to your old medical school uh, theories, trust your clinical skills and treat your patient, but not the investigation. So treat the patient in front of you and be prepared and approached as a team. If you are in doubt, don't think to or don't hesitate to uh, escalate to a senior person. I think that's uh, what you have to learn during this case discussion. Thank you very much, Madam, for that very insightful case discussion we had. We have received quite a few questions, uh, case by case. So from the first case, we have a question um, concerning the patient with the syncope episode where you mentioned about the adrenaline stress dose. So our viewers want to know what is meant by an adrenaline stress dose. Yes, yes. Uh, that's fairly really commonly common. we use in uh, emergency yeah, care settings that we don't, we don't have, have access. Sometimes, sometimes, most, most of the time, time we don't have access, access to ephedrine. And uh, 
So uh, we can use one in hundred thousand uh, at Berlin and uh, take a two to three email of uh, such such prepared at Berlin to uh, push uh, or to keep the blood pressure uh, temporarily in a stable position until we get a proper uh, uh, so proper solution like starting IV fluid or IV adrenaline or uh, inotropes or vasopressors. So to, just as a temporary measure, we are using this uh, stress dose of adrenaline. Next question is asked from the same case where you mentioned, Madam, what is the heart rate BP criteria to diagnose a patient in periorist? Well, there's, There's no heart, heart rate, rate or blood, blood pressure, pressure criteria, criteria to diagnose in periorist conditions, but it's purely clinical. Uh, if you, uh, if the patient's in um, tachycardia and suddenly the heart rate is dropping and the blood pressure is dropping, that means patient is going to uh, unstable conditions. So the, we know that tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism uh, in shock. So, so if, if the patient is developing bradycardia on top of this hypertension, that, that means patient is going to an unstable, unstable cardiac arrest condition. condition. So, so that's, that's why, why we have to identify and act, act immediately. If the, the heart, heart rate is dropping, dropping and, and you know, all, anyway that blood pressure has dropped in the hypertension patient. So, so if the tachycardia is suddenly going to a bradycardia, then that is imply that patient is going to a cardiac arrest. Then it is called a peri arrest situation. Next question is also from the same clinical scenario where we spoke yeah. about the PERC rule, madam, concerning pulmonary embolism. And our viewers want to know how to apply the PERC rule in a clinical setting. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think I, I mentioned that. that. Uh, first, first, you, you can, can apply, apply the Well score. Uh, uh, or there are so, so many scores, scores for the clinical, clinical probability. probability. That is, these scores, scores we are applying to uh, diagnose whether there's a possibility of pulmonary embolism in this uh, presentation. presentation. So, so first, first you, you can, can have, have to apply, apply the Bell score, score, modified Bell score, score is now available. If, if the, the score, score is less than, than four, four, that, that means, means the patient's having low risk, risk or uh, pulmonary embolism is very unlikely. unlikely. So, so in, in that, that case, we want to rule out, out exactly this, whether this patient can be safely discharged without further investigation. So patients who have a low risk category, then we can apply the PERC rule. Not, not for the, the high risk category, category only, only for the, the low risk category. category. You apply you the PERC rule. Uh, you, you can, can uh, uh, search in the, the internet and you can, can find the meta. And, and then, then if, if the PERC rule, rule is negative, then, then without, without doing further, further investigation, you can discharge the patient. You can exclude therapy. There's no pulmonary embolism. But if it is positive, then we can't exclude. So we have to do a D time. If the D time is negative, then, then you, you can, can discharge, discharge the patient. But, but if the D-time is positive, is positive then, then definitely, definitely you have, have to go for the uh, uh, further the testing, testing that, that is CDPA. Next question, madam. Uh, it's concerning the next case where we spoke about mesenteric ischemia. Uh, our viewers want to know how to diagnose possible mesenteric ischemia from an ultrasound scan. Well, uh, it's, it's a bit of an advanced, advanced uh, sonography. You, you can, can see some supportive uh, things like, like obvious thing was uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes dilated bowel and, and sometimes, sometimes you can, can see the um, AR in the eccentric wall, wall. The, uh, uh, and, and sometimes, sometimes evidence of perforations like, like AR, especially in the diaphragm, you can visualize uh, uh, in a uh, bedside, bedside scan. scan. And, and uh, you can, can assess the vasculation and uh, see the dot level and, and assess whether the, the, there's a blood flow of the particular area. area. And, and sometimes, sometimes uh, a very ecogenicity of the uh, bowel, bowel balls. balls. So, so it's, it's, it's a bit of, of advanced thing, and sometimes, sometimes it's not possible to diagnose mesenteric uh, ischemia at the bedside. It's only, so only just supportive evidence to find out whether there's a bowel pathology or not. So it's purely clinical diagnosis, and you have a CT scan. Program. Next question, madam. We spoke about crashed airways and difficult airway intubations. Mm -hmm. Our viewers want to know whether you can recommend any reading material for difficult airway algorithm when intubating and managing airways in critically ill patients. Well, um, 
there are uh, difficulty available you know that's a difficulty of a society you can search and download this available uh, but it is only for the uh, patients who we can assess the difficulty of so sometimes in the critical uh, critical care settings uh, then uh, you uh, don't uh, I find, find this, this uh, uh, difficulty, yeah, yeah, so we had to go with the crisis situation. So, so there, there uh, you, you can, can search, search on the lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, 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 lots of internet uh, resources, uh, and uh, if you can click on to this crisis intubation, I mean, difficulty of intubation, uh, you have to read. Uh, uh, there are lots of materials, but. Uh, um, uh, you can go to Walsh criteria. That's uh, this is a person who uh, diagnosed or who had uh, uh, developed an algorithm uh, for this uh, crisis uh, intubation. And remember, always in the crisis intubation, it's purely clinical basis. So you should not stick to the uh, the algorithm. Uh, if you are not, um, uh, if you feel this patient's uh, required uh, failed. Uh, if this should be failed intubation, then go ahead with the uh, rescue procedures rather than just stick to the algo. This is something important in emergency settings because always read your patient and act according to the, your patient, but just the algos or the, all the guidelines should be supportive. We were speaking about patients who are unresponsive, madam. Uh, our viewers want to know what uh, the point of doing NCCT brain in an acute stage of any of these presentations if we can't find the cause for the unresponsiveness? Well, I always uh, tell him that uh, um, the CT scan or the further investigations are always supportive and you have to uh, keep it as a last resource for your diagnosis. So unresponsiveness could it be due to various reasons that's why you have to take the history first if, we, if it is a metabolic cause like uh, hyperglycemia so purely you have to correct it you don't want to do a ct scan but if you found that uh, history suggests you some acute unresponsiveness and otherwise uh, healthy person or uh, otherwise well uh, behaved person and uh, then you couldn't uh, exclude uh, electrolyte or metabolic problems uh, with your bedside assessment, then you have to go ahead with a CT scan because uh, if it is a, a intracranial hemorrhage or cerebral edema or whatever the other pathology, then uh, you can uh, do the treatment at the same time. So it is something that to, as advanced management strategy, you have to apply in unconscious patient, not as the base, basic investigation. Uh, we spoke about uh, gastric lavage, madam, and how gastric lavage is now not indicated. Um, our viewers want to know, is gastric lavage not indicated for other toxins as well, or is it only having a limited place for erosives? No, uh, gastric lavage, uh, now we are discouraging because there's a problem with uh, gastric lavage, especially with the pediatric. And... Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes we know that we have to uh, insert an NG tube and do this uh, uh, lavage. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a difficult and practically difficult. And sometimes it causes more problems rather than the benefit. So that's why uh, we are discouraging to go ahead with whatever the poison, uh, not to do lavage, uh, but you can give charcoal. And uh, so uh, sometimes you may have to give uh, multiple doses of charcoal. There are some indications and up to four hours, sometimes you can go for, uh, uh, have a time limit to uh, go with the activated charcoal, uh, especially significant overdose, but not the gastric lavage or induced vomiting. Uh, next question, madam. What are the indications to select awake intubation? Well, uh, there are several indications, but uh, in perspective of uh, emergency uh, critical care settings, uh, if you found that uh, uh, you uh, found that uh, if there's a, some sort of a difficulty in uh, intubation, like uh, difficulty of alpha. So that is one thing you can go with the awake intubation because uh, you don't want to paralyze the patient. You don't want just give some mild sedation. And if you have the resources, you can go with that. Uh, that is, we 
we prepare pre prepared that uh, we pre assess the patient is having uh, some difficulty away. And if there's a facial or a uh, neck trauma, yes, you can go with the uh, uh, awake intubation uh, because uh, blind intubation may cause more harm sometimes and may not be possible. So we need to have expert and the resources. So it's not possible in all ways, all the time in all settings. So it's something uh, advanced technology we have to use. But if you have video laryngoscope, you can use that in, uh, instead of a foil. Um, our viewers also want to know the place of a Philadelphia collar in spinal cord injuries, cervical spine. Yeah, that's a very good uh, 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 conversation uh, because in recent past, uh, there are lots of uh, research and theories uh, have found and they mentioned that if the patient is conscious and uh, obey the commands and can uh, maintain the airway uh, and uh, then uh, can uh, ap uh, apply, uh, comply with your advices, then you can put a cervical collar if you're suspecting significant mechanism of injury, uh, but not for the neck trauma, but uh, for the other injuries. But if the patient is um, very agitated and uh, uh, aggressive, uh, then it's better to avoid uh, cervical collar because that will cause more harm since the patient is moving head uh, and neck with the, against the resistance. So that will cause more harm to the cervical spine. So Philadelphia collar is a call, rigid collar. It's going out with most of the time, but for the transport purposes, we can use, but uh, for the clinical uh, scenarios, we are now using soft color and moving to soft color compared to the Philadelphia color. Uh, Madam, we have more requests uh, concerning uh, clarifications and for you to please explain about the adrenaline stress dose again and again, and how, what are the indications for us to use it in a clinical practice? Yeah, that's uh, one in 100,000 you can prepare. Uh, uh, you know how to prepare the one in 10,000. So you have to be prepared the one in 100,000 and you can use a 10 ml of that and of them you can use a one to two ml at a time. So uh, in uh, especially we are using uh, in a patient so one shock and uh, then going to intubate. So to keep up the vitals, uh, a uh, bit of a stable position. This is a temporary measure or until uh, you are going patient in very critical condition until you are going to start uh, vasopressors or uh, uh, inotropes, you can keep the blood pressure a bit elevated giving this uh, stress dose. So, and sometimes in sepsis, uh, we can use the stress dose, see whether the patient is responding to this uh, vasopressors, but this is actually in crisis situation like intubation and until you prepare the, your uh, medications uh, to keep the patient on to avoid cardiac arrest uh, and uh, to keep a bit of a stabilize the patient this is remember this is a temporary measure the same thing we are applying with the ephedrine uh, which we don't have uh, in the most of the time not in the critical care emergency setting Madam, last final question. Uh, we spoke about how uh, when patients are agitated, we might need to pre-sedate them uh, prior to intubation. Our viewers want to know, can they use opioids? Is there a in contraindication in using opioids in the emergency setting if there is an agitated patient prior to intubation? Well, we know that opioids more or less for the analgesia, not for sedation, but you can uh, use some fentanyl, small dose, but uh, you know, the sedative dose like ketamine, uh, midazolam, they have a very good uh, sedative property. So those are the we commonly use, but uh, fentanyl it has some sort of a sedative component, but you can use because we are giving just to calm down the patient, uh, but we are not using morphine as a sedative uh, agent uh, in uh, uh, delayed sequence induction or in agitated patient. Uh, Madam, I think that's the time we have for today for the questions. We received many more questions and many uh, topics that our viewers wanted more clarifications, which we hope to discuss on further 
lectures and further webinars. So thank you very much, Madam, for joining us today and giving this very insightful and very algorithmically clinical practice wise, which we can apply every day in our uh, practice in our hospital settings. Um, thank you, viewers, for your active participation again. We will be uploading this lecture in our official YouTube channel within this coming week. So if you missed some of the lecture parts which you need clarification on, uh, please log into our channel, please subscribe, and you can rewatch all our webinars which we have done so far, which has come to a total of almost 73 lectures. Um, we hope to see you again next Sunday with another lecture with a new topic that is timely and important in our clinical practice. Thank you very much.